Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for June 27th, 2018. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Soretta, and today I'm going to sit down with Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom's co-writer and producer, Colin Trevorrow, to talk about that film. We are going to go full spoiler mode, so... uh if you have not seen the latest Jurassic World movie, you might want to turn this off and save this until after you have seen that. Uh, you know, I recorded this uh, a couple of weeks ago, the day after the film premiered in Los Angeles. And I sat down with Colin in an empty lobby of a hotel in downtown Los Angeles. I intended to do a traditional interview, but uh, as you'll hear in my first question, Colin suggested that we do a spoiler cast, which basically means going through the spoilers of the film. So I, I kind of threw out most of my questions and j just went into the spoilers, but it turned out pretty well. He talks about what he what the intentions were with the ending of Jurassic World, because I, I coming out of that movie, I, I did think there was a disparity between what Goldblum says uh, what Malcolm says in that final scene and what we're seeing on screen. And I think uh, Trevorrow explains that uh, uh, pretty well. And also he gives a lot of hints of uh, what we can expect from Jurassic World 3 and talks about that big twist. Here is my interview with Jurassic World co-writer and producer Colin Trevorrow. Let's start at the beginning. Okay. Uh, when did the idea behind this film come about? Um, but we had a, we had a beginning, a middle, and an end, and we knew the end of the middle, uh, the end of this movie, which, uh, I don't know if this is a, is this a spoiler cast or not, do we talk we about it? We can do it? that. Uh, whatever you think. What, yeah. What, what do you Let's guys do Okay. You know, we knew that we wanted to, to structurally to bring this into like a, a, just a tight, constricted, claustrophobic funnel of, of a, of a vice and then let it all explode. Uh, and, and open up really wide. And uh, we also knew that we wanted to take the idea of, of not just a cloned dinosaur, but uh, the, the emotional uh, needs that would go into realizing that you are of another time and, and of another place and are, and are displaced uh, and struggling with that identity and all those things that hopefully we get to think about in the future. Uh, and, you know, just the, the, the idea that these... Dinosaurs are animals, uh, and that they have rights, and that uh, there's a question as to whether they deserve to live, or whether we have a responsibility to them. All those ideas we felt were were the, the right place to uh, to go in the middle. It's interesting because for this franchise, we didn't start caring about the dinosaurs until your films. I think a little bit in the first one, and this one a lot. Right. Uh, Traditionally, they've been just monsters. Right. Now, we're the, kind of the monsters. I mean, like, I half agree. Like, I feel like as fans, we cared about them. Yeah. And, you know, and I think I just, I took that love and just transferred it into the story. Because uh, I, you know, we love the T-Rex and we love those raptors, even though we, you know, we know they'll bite your head off. And it felt like just a natural progression to, you know, apply that fan love uh, to, to the characters and to the world. Uh, I also think that, no franchise can continue or, or garner anyone's interest unless it's a character-based franchise, unless you actually care about what's going to happen to those people from one movie to the next. Jurassic had never really had that. It wasn't the way that it was built. Uh, you, would, you, you would take one lead from a previous film and put them in the next film and get them into a bad situation and they would run away. Yeah. And it, I knew that there's no way that we could do three movies of that again. Uh, the audience would abandon us. And so we, uh, we turned it into a character franchise with humans and dinosaurs. So when you initially went in to pitch to Frank and Steven for the first one, did you have this whole idea for this trilogy arc? Or when did that come? No, I, that, I, I made no presumptions at that point. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was focused uh, on just, you know, how we would reintroduce it to a new generation and how we would rebuild something without, you know, replicating it completely. And, and that was the focus there. Once we made the film and we got to start asking the question of whether anyone would ever want to see another, which I, you know, I would never assume. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we, we really started talking about it and, you know, I, I actually, I'm one of those people who feels like there, there could have just been one Jurassic park. And I, I spend, you know, most of my 
waking hours trying to convince myself that that's not true, uh, yeah. that, that we deserve, uh, not as, not as creatives, but that this story deserves to be told on this scale. Uh, and I've managed to convince myself I've drunk my own Kool-Aid. <laughs> well, I think that's something that's interesting about your films. And I, I think people write them off as, you know, big blockbuster or whatever, but the first one, the film is kind of about the idea of making a sequel. And it, is that a good idea? Is that a bad idea? Um, yeah. but you have like these, these ideas in them that I think a lot of big budget films don't, yeah. uh, you know, uh, what, what I wanted to ask you is that on set, Frank mentioned that originally you wanted to take this film much further mm -hmm. into the story that you had plotted out for these next or the next film yeah. whatever you know where it was, I mean the ending was the same it was it was that we wanted to yeah we wanted to to cycle further forward into the integration of the animals into the world I think because we were so excited and uh, and what we found is that by doing that it it's sort of diffused this story that we were telling and if it was really going to be effective we had to show that restraint so much of, of writing is restraint yeah uh, and and just recognizing that if we if we just blow it all out and lay it all on the screen we're going to have nowhere left to go so uh you know that's why when when derek and i talked about the second movie we talked about the second and the third and there were there were so many ideas because all writers know that it's too many ideas is usually oh, yeah. the problem. It's, it's never not enough. And so making sure that we were just judicious and, and thoughtful and, and made a singular experience specifically you know, designed for Bayona uh, that, that would work. But, you know, to answer your earlier question, it's, it's funny. I, I observed that too, that, that, uh, you know, people are, are certainly identifying a, a thread of, of anti-authoritarianism in, in my stories. Yeah. Uh, you know, the first one is, is a pretty anti-corporate film while being funded by a giant corporation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and about a, a very corporate character breaking out of that construct and, and you know, embracing nature. And uh, the second film is, is clearly, you know, about animal rights and, uh, and you know, the effect that we're having on the environment and, and uh, you know, the ecology of the planet. Uh, I was raised by hippies in San Francisco and Oakland. Like, this is who I am. And it's, it's just sort of now, I think because I make these giant blockbusters, people kind of assume uh, that, I, uh, that I am one way. But, you know, I wrote this shit out of Vermont, man. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I live on a farm. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to burn it down. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, I, I think, it's, it's, I think it's, it's a responsibility to put some of these ideas in these films. They reach so many people. Um, this... Uh This film takes things in a very different direction. Is there any concern that maybe audiences uh, might not like where you're headed? Every day, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the I, I have to be concerned about that yeah. uh, because I'm I'm so hyper aware of the emotional resonance uh, and value placed uh, in the in the main character that we're killing in this movie. We we yeah. burn down the island. And, you know, we treat that in a way uh, that we would any other, you know, major character that we love. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, the burning of a church or a temple when it happens. Uh, and uh, we, we understand all of the risks inherent in that. But we also we also know that we we have to move forward in a way that feels organic uh, to the story that everybody loves. And, uh, you know, I hope that people embrace it and, 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 and understand what we're doing and are able to go with us. But that's, that's really so much what this kind of storytelling is. When you're making a new version of something that people love, you're just kind of holding out your hand and saying, like, come with me across this bridge. Are you willing to come with me? And, and you yeah. hope that they'll walk. Um, you were talking about the ending before, and uh, I do really like this film, but I'm a little confused by the ending. And I'm wondering okay. if you can clarify it, because what Jeff Goldblum is kind of... Or, Malcolm is trying right. to uh, say it, it paints kind of like this grand vision of like there's tons of dinosaurs out there, but like it seems to me that there's only like a dozen or two dozen dinosaurs, and it'd be easy to just like send the National Guard out and capture or kill them. Like, well, but there this... was also all the DNA that went out. I mean, it's there's maybe it's only one shot, but there's a shot of a briefcase with like yeah, 20 yeah. different kinds of species in it uh, that were all you know sold off as well. And uh, I, I, you know, I think that he's he's a predictor. And so what he's saying is, like, he's, you know, he's Al Gore, and he's saying, like, look, you know, I predicted that, you know, that this 
global equilibrium that everybody was so confident would remain exactly the same has clearly not <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we, we again, we didn't want to go too far and, and we're certainly going to jump into the future uh, in the next movie uh, a little bit further down the line. But uh, really, we felt like, the, you know, the responsibility of, of a second film is to make sure that at the very end, uh, everything has changed and nothing will ever be the same. Uh, and and that's, that's where we leave it. It's interesting because I, I don't know what that third film is because like I feel like it's court hearings where we're like, how do we protect these dinosaurs? <laughs> well, it's not, you know, I don't see it as being a, a domestically, uh, it's not a localized story because you know, they're going yeah. all over the world. Uh, and, and I feel like the ability, you know, there's a line in the first movie, uh, which I think we left in the movie, where he says, we, we won't always be the only ones who can make a dinosaur. Uh, and in this one, he's saying, you know, they're going to make more. And, uh, you know, the idea that, that InGen and that, you know, that, that this one guy, that Dr. Wu is the only person who knows how to do this after 30 years of, uh, of this technology existing starts to strain credibility for me. You know, there's Mac, there's PC, there's uh, yeah, people yeah. learn technology, nuclear power. You know, he mentions at the beginning, you know, at, at first it was the U.S. And, you know, now, what is it, 15 countries that, yeah. that can do it? It's only been 50 years. Um, let's rewind for a second. Uh, the opening sequence is probably the best opening sequence of this franchise. Actually, it is the best Thank you. opening sequence Thank you. of this franchise. And it seems to have some ideas in earlier, like Spielberg ideas of earlier films, or is that not Probably true? just instinctively. Just instinctively? Like it, yeah, I, did, I didn't pull from anything. It was, it was really just a, uh, there were, I knew we were going to uh, completely, you know, shift the ground beneath the feet of the franchise over the course of the movie and so I wanted to construct a sequence that was the ultimate Jurassic Park <laughs> like like everything <laughs> yellow raincoats and dinosaurs in the rain and like just multiple layers of peril and, uh, and you know there's obviously a story point to it it's not completely random but uh, you know that's you know me and Derek and, and Jay Bayona just working in concert to do the ultimate tribute to everything we love about the franchise before we start to move the franchise in a different direction. And you, you mentioned at the premiere last night that uh, Spielberg would be giddy seeing the concept art that Jay was producing. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? I, you know, he, there's there's just an energy that uh, erupts in him when he sees something new, and you know look, as you are saying before, like what we're doing here is new. And some people might not like it, some people might not, but the ideas in the film, the identity, you know, the identity of the girl, the, you know, the, the way that we take it, the question that we're asking, and then also just the visuals that Bayona was able to bring up, he would just get fired up about it. Because he's a, you know, he's a creative person and, you know, way deep down, you know, he just wants to be entertained. Well, it seems like uh, the idea of like weaponized dinosaurs and uh, genetically modified things c came from things he was working on with yeah. that original four draft. Like, how much did that influence where you? Where That's definitely you know that vein of it is is Stephen's vein, uh, you know, in all of this storytelling, and and so our relationship when it comes to that has been about you know me listening and and trusting that you know Stephen has had a million amazing ideas over time and, and trying to find a way to, to uh, tr present it and translate it to the world visually and from a story standpoint uh, in a way that I feel, you know, is, is grounded in, in the way that we're telling the rest of the story. For example, you know, in the first film, as opposed to, you know, having, you know, you can, you can take militarized raptors in two ways. You can have them jump out of a helicopter with parachutes and take out a drug dealer. Uh, which was in one early script, uh, or or you can dial that all the way back to the very first moment that someone realized that they might follow in that order. Uh, and that's what we did. And so, you know, in this film, similarly, just kind of dialing it back to a place that feels like it could exist, to, you know, in our world, and we are not, uh, I don't want to say jumping the shark, that feels like too direct yeah. <laughs> a reference. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about... Um... Meezy and the the reveal in this film because it's it's very interesting. I didn't see it coming. I really like was wow. like who is this? I thought like maybe she was related to someone from the first film or I something. Was, I'm so hor like my I'm so worried that it's too telegraphed over the course of the movie. Like that was that balance. I didn't even get it when I saw the photo. Oh, I cool. mean other people. No, yeah, you get it, it when you find out. Well, that's what you know. We that scene at the end is just to make sure that that people yeah. who hadn't gotten it because it, it isn't isn't said clearly. But I think when you you know when you when you see how many different moments you know you know that that book and the picture and you know did yeah. she look like me all those moments uh, it is layered in so it, that when you finally 
uh, discover it, it can be a surprise without like making you throw your popcorn out and walk out of the theater. Yeah. Um, I get super fired up about giant turns like that. I think it's clear by now. <laughs> like, like I just, I really yeah. do. Like I think that audiences are in this moment, uh, both culturally in America, where we are used to things happening every day that are like shocking turns that that we're just becoming desensitized to. And I'm really into reflecting that in storytelling. And this is one of those moments. Uh, I, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't shock me if if something like that were to be revealed. You know, well, I just heard yeah. a couple months ago that, you know, Barbara Streisand cloned her dog. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're not that far <laughs> off. <laughs> Does that come out of, like, we need someone to press that button? Or does that come like you know? What I mean? No, it's the other way around. It's the you know we're gonna we're gonna have this character, and now who would press that button out of this group? It was a reverse engine. Oh, okay. Uh, but you know, it, it, it's it is okay. an impossible decision. Uh, who would make it? You know, a child who who is able to see things not in a simple way, but in a you know in a very pure that that sense of right and wrong that only children have that adults kind of get muddied and mired over time, which is another theme of you know, a lot of films I've made. The simplicity of, of childhood morality. Yeah. Uh, since you're hinting that the next one might go global, or you're not hinting, you said that, uh, <laughs> um, is there a chance that we might need some other characters to come back, like Grant and Sattler? And- there, there's, uh, <laughs> I am so interested in that, I can't tell you. Uh, I, you know, I... Uh, with all of these characters, I, I have such respect for them, and I'm I'm very careful. Maybe I've been too cautious, if anything, yeah. and I've, I've brought them back in in ways that have only felt absolutely organic to the story that we're telling. Uh, but I do think that we we may have earned uh, the opportunity to to engage them a little more. That's all I'll say. But you know, yeah, I, I I don't just uh, I don't just trot them out uh, to yeah. make a buck. I, I respect them so much. It would have felt weird if Go- if Malcolm was along for this journey. I whatever. wouldn't have bought it. Yeah, yeah, me neither. I, about it. Um, I have one last question about yeah. Book of Henry. Oh, boy. You said on Twitter that uh, the story is, in a way, a carving copy of A New Hope. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> now I have do, you, do you want to explain that? I will. I mean, it is, it is, uh, you know, it's a foundational myth. It's a noble ghost story uh, where a character uh, lives on after death in order to guide uh, a hero to find their strength and defeat ultimate evil. Uh, and, you know, structurally, uh, you know, I, I can't, but you're going to print this, unfortunately, I'm saying this now, but the way that I look at movies and the way that I, I do see kind of Avatar and, and Titanic and Jurassic World are, are very similar movies. You know, Henry was Obi-Wan Kenobi, and he died in the middle, and he left a set of instructions of how to take out the Death Star where Darth Vader was holding a princess captive. Uh, and at the very end, uh, when he had the target in his sights, he had to remember his training. Uh, guided by this this ghostly voice, and then Han Solo comes in with the <laughs> with the Rube Goldberg machine and, and gives him the moments, uh, and ultimately the princess saves herself. I think that's a good explanation. It, to me, it's it, I, you know Star Wars is a foundational myth, uh, and I think that in the same way that we use Joseph Campbell as a foundational myth for so long, we're now going to start using Star Wars as a foundational myth to tell other stories. I know I'm going to get a lot of shit for this on Twitter, and <laughs> I regret that you asked me. But I, I, I'm it's sure just the you way will, I saw it. It's the way know. I saw it. Then, yeah. No. I hope people can understand how how earnestly, uh, you know, I I look at my uh, at, at these stories, and, and I, I almost from like a, a hyper earnest childlike perspective. Uh, but someday I'll grow up. I promise. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much, you. Colin. I appreciate Thank it. You. And there you have it: my interview with Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom co-writer and producer. Colin Trevorrow. Uh, I think he is much smarter than the internet gives him credit for, and uh, I, I hope people don't uh, go crazy with this whole uh, a New Hope book of Henry uh, comparison that he makes at the, the, the end of this discussion, but... You never know. Anyways, uh, we will be back tomorrow with our usual news episode. Uh, you can find all of our podcasts on all of the popular podcast platforms. Uh, this podcast, Slash Home Daily, is published every weekday. Uh, please go to iTunes. Give us a rating. Give us a good review. Spread the word. Tell your friends. And we'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>